Good evening and nice to see you again this evening. And before I start this evening, I want to ask a favour of you. I've been trying different types of ways to get the sound level at a, at a level that really helps. And I want, if this is an improvement tonight, would you be willing just to send a message to Alice? And I don't need everybody, but certainly if you have not been hearing so well or if you hear better tonight, would you let us know? That would be great. And we're trying to get things right, get them better for Sundays, obviously. So that'd be a great help. But we're now going to think about the chapter, which is called God's Curtain. Up to September 1951, they had not been tested financially. The mission put money in the bank at Shanghai for them. Arthur telegraphed, and then it came as he had need of it. But in the autumn of that year, Red China had ordered all funds from abroad to be frozen. Well, Arthur and Wilde didn't hear about this, but when Felix, the policeman, heard about it, he pounced on it. He was the head of the local police force, and he had lost face because earlier on, through no fault of Arthur's or Wilde's, whenever he had done something wrong to them and it had been found out, it's a very terrible thing if you have to lose face. And no heathen oriental, and I quote, will ever forgive that. In the days when the Kingfisher was hoping to convert Arthur, their belongings had been searched by the police and Felix had helped himself to their two cameras. Well, he was forced to return them, and that's what caused this problem, where he had to lose face. I mean, they would have gladly given their cameras to him if they had known, and if they had thought it would have caused any offence. But it was out of their hands. As we know, September days were taken up with Wilda's illness, and it was not until the middle of October that Arthur awoke with a stark realisation that the bank was not answering his request for any money. Something must be wrong, so they began to economise on everything. By this time, Ben and Timothy were returned from their missionary work out in the countryside among the Mongol peoples, and they came to the little kitchen one day. It was while Ben was in one, in one day that Arthur involuntarily, half thinking aloud, wondered what they would do if their money, their remittance, did not soon arrive. And within a few minutes, Ben was rifling his own pockets and handing him over the equivalent of seven US dollars. Oh, Arthur was so ashamed. He would not listen to them, of course. To ben wouldn't take the money back. And so they made a covenant. He and Wilda will never, ever again talk about money in the presence of other people. They said, look, we'll take it as a loan and thank them for it, but only a loan. By the end of October, five or six days of coal supply was all was left. 14 days of flour and half a pound of sugar. And should they not now write to Shanghai and ask the bank why money was not coming? They could begin to substitute cheaper things to save their dwindling money. For instance, the huge stove. It was eating up two thirds of all the money they had, just in its coal. So Arthur stuck some bricks in the firebox to make it smaller. The next effort was to light the fire only twice a day, once in the morning and once in the evening. And he fixed up a hay box and Wilda cooked their lunch in the pressure cooker while she made breakfast. Then she put that in the hay box and that kept it warm until noontime with a thermos of hot water they had enough. And it was good that winter because the sunshine was a little, there was some warmth and they had all their wadded thermal clothes on. Arthur began to look for brushwood to burn instead of coal and he, he contemplated making the natives kind of coal balls out of dust with manure. They were down to three tattered local bills, the equivalent of 15 cents or 10 pence in our money here, when a telegram arrived. We've already sent, it said, two remittance, remittances. Understand this has been frozen in sinning by the police order. And without police permission, no bank will issue your money. It was signed by the Shanghai Bank. So, this was the procedure. They had to apply to who? Felix, who of course was very annoyed, had lost face. And so, up the street to the familiar old office goes Arthur and presents himself before Felix. I understand, he said, that the sinning police have frozen our funds from Shanghai and that I must apply to you for them. That's the new government regulations. 
but I only have this money left, and he produced these three tattered bills, enough to buy three matchboxes. That was all, as he and both Felix knew. Um, well, what do I do now, he said. Go back and write out your report, and we'll investigate, Felix said. So, back Arthur goes to the arduous task of writing a report in Chinese character. But at last it was finished, he returns to Felix's footstool, so to speak, and by him stood a scruffy little runner. The latter reached out for the report, stuffed it in his pocket, and said casually, All right, go home. This is our affair. Still, with only ten pence worth of tattered money in his pocket, Arthur came home. It was winter, remember. It took six weeks for Felix to investigate but as Arthur has often said, it did not take the Lord six weeks. As he entered the compound, cold and despairing, he saw the postman standing there. Oh, Ma Mushi, he cried. A supply of dollars, about 45 US dollars, had been telephoned to you from Chongqing. Come up to the office tonight and get it. The feather curtain of God had softly fallen over his children, as man had deliberately planned starvation for them. Mr. Ellison, one of the CIM, the China Inland Mission Workers in Chongqing, hearing of their plight, had taken a million Chinese dollars, that is, to the telephone office and said, Here you are, please send this or to Arthur in his Chinese name and address. The telephone was the only route that was not frozen. Moreover, Mr. Ellison had applied for exit and two days later his permit came through and he had to leave. He knew nothing of the only 15 cents, 10 pence condition of the Matthews family on that day. Ah, as the Bible says, now shall you see what I will do. And the money was sent. Of course, if it had been sent by the other route, Felix would have intercepted it. So Arthur took no chances. First of all, he repaid their debt to Ben. Then he bought coal, potatoes and flour, everything they would need. He tried to turned the money into food and things that the police could not touch. And this was the reason there was heat in the kitchen when Lila came down with the fever later on. Arthur writes, and I quote, Chung King came to light with one million dollars. That's the 45 American. We cannot yet fathom how the sum of money managed to run the blockade. Enough that we have a heavenly father who makes the schedule. And into that schedule came one of my offending molars that needed a spot of cash in my pocket to persuade me to take the plunge with the local doctor of dismal repute. <laughs> Having lost a big piece of it six months ago, I've been able to keep it reasonably quiet till the very last night when the money came, and then on that night I could not sleep at all. So I went round the next morning to get as much tummy fodder packed away as possible, and then off I went, goofy enough to believe that one tug would do it. Two hours on a backless bench, on a freezing cold dirt floor, provided valuable experience for what seemed to be a hopeless case. And then another day, and I still have my head, half a tooth, for a dentist home to at home to tackle. Well, he had to be very careful what he said, for his letters were often opened at the Chinese post office and read by those who knew some English before being forwarded. So he later referred to the frozen funds as looker, on ice. As the China Inland Mission learned of Felix's intention to starve the Matthews family, others began to plan ways to help them, and prayer went up by great volume. One missionary found that a certain dollar bill, like a 45 cents worth in American money, would just fit an unimportant Chinese envelope, and once a week he sent them that. This paid for Lila's milk supply. You see, the Chinese do not milk cows, but the Muslims do, and Tibetans milk the yak. An old Tibetan woman was accustomed to bringing them two bowls each day, and that was kept for Lila. Of course, the lack of milk affected the teeth of both Wilda and Arthur, and Arthur's toothache became more painful. But where was the money to get it pulled? On the back of the month of December, the little calendar holds this. Cast four anchors and prayed for day. You may have read that in the Acts of the Apostles. It's in chapter 27, verses 27 to 29. 
And the verse says, As we were driven to and fro in the seeds of Adria, they let go four anchors from the stern and prayed for the day. Andrew Murray, one of the South, South African devotional writer, he says this, These four anchors remind me of, number one, say he brought me here, and it's by his will I am in this straight place, and in fact I will rest. Number two, he will keep me here in his love and give me grace to behave as his child. Number three, then he will make the trial a blessing, teaching me the lessons he intends for me to learn. Number four, in his good time, he can bring me out again, how and when he knows. So let me say, I am here by God's appointment. Number two, in his keeping. Number three, in his training. Four, for his time. So by faith, Arthur and Wilda cast these four anchors. The first sign that these anchors would hold came in the early arrival of a Christmas parcel. It was from the Macintoshes at Sinning and was followed in two weeks by a second one. Wilder writes, Amy Macintosh had said it was a tin of cookies. So we weren't prepared for the large carton box containing not only a large five pound tin of several kinds of biscuits, but another small tin of biscuits, a large fruit cake, sugar, tea, cocoa tin of hard candy, two packages of candles, raisins, lard and marmalade, and among the biscuits were some animal shapes for Lila. Wow, how her eyes sparkled when she saw the little dogs. It was the first candy she had ever had. You can't imagine what it did mean to us. Well, we haven't had any dessert of any kind of sweet thing or any kind of sweet thing for so long that we have been starved of it. Well, they took, this took care of their tummy. But what about fuel and dental charges and other necessities? Arthur remembers walking up and down the little icy cold bedroom, singing and praying. Master, the tempest is raging, the billows are tossing high. Carest thou not that we perish? It seemed to come like an answer. It's not the storm that worries the Lord. It's the unbelief of the disciples. Six weeks from the time they had notified Felix that all they had left was that 15 cents, a policeman arrived in a courtyard, into the courtyard. Well, he said, how are you getting on? Well, I told you 42 days ago that we only had this amount of money, said Arthur. You know that your government has frozen our money and we cannot get it unless you give it to us. I've tried again and again to contact our bank in Shanghai, but there's been no response. At that moment, Arthur truly had none of it in cash left. After inspecting the ceiling for a few moments longer, the policeman got up and left. Now note this. He had come in by the gate, but he didn't return that way. Some idea had come into his head to go through the chapel and out of the compound that way. As he entered the chapel, a mailboy from the post office came in by the gate. And before the policeman had reached the street, he was saying to Arthur, Here is a registered letter for you. It was from the bank, and it contained currency to the equivalent of 45 US dollars. If the postman had come in one minute earlier, Arthur would have had to confess the possession of this money. But God's feather curtain had fallen. The bamboo curtain shouts and bellows as it descends, boasts and preens itself. But the feather curtain of God falls silently. It is soft and comforting to the sheltered one. But it is intangible, mysterious and baffling to the non-believer. Felix, on hearing his policemen's report of their destitution, sent word that they might draw whatever amounts he cared to give in response to their estimate of monthly needs. But there had to be a fresh, a fresh application every month. Another answer to prayer at this time was for Lila's scar scarlet fever. Bob Ament was another CIM missionary. He had the happy thought to send vitamin pills, and Arthur writes to him to say thank you. On the 12th of March, 1952, Arthur says, Your second instalment of pills arrived the day before yesterday. Your first parcel had been looked at and seeing it was only 40, it had 40 odd in it, I jumped to the conclusion that somebody had filched it. But when the second parcel came in, our fears were relieved. 
Lila took two on successive days, and on the second evening we were amazed to hear her call for supper, an hour before it was due. Five minutes after she had been set down, she was waving an empty bowl in one hand and a spoon in the other. And then we had to fill her bowl with our food. And when that was done, great hunks of dry bread were stuffed into her mouth. It was exciting for a change. Another snowfall last night and bright sun today, so everywhere is slushy. I put Lila on an old bench and push her up and down to give her a taste of sledging. But we don't let her play in it because she has no shoes to change into. It's a great game paddling down to the creek these days. I go early before it gets too slushy and take off socks. Even so, plenty of cold ice and snow and slush slops in. I have a new look on life now. I'm constantly, th constantly thinking of the hungry beggars since our December experience. And when it's like this, my sympathies are with the poor water-carrying women who have cloth shoes. Can you imagine? We certainly are learning that the man who really lives does not live by bread alone. In our Lord's temptation, the point was to assail him along the line of complete willing submission to the appointment of place, circumstance, and method of God's will, which, coming down to our level, means that for us to deny ourselves, that complete submission and sheer trust is to deny our spirits the sustenance they require and will reduce us to living by bread alone, which is not living but starvation. It was during this time of being driven up and down the Adria, to quote from the Bible, Acts 27 again, that the Lord gave Arthur this green leaf out of the drought of financial sickness and stress. It was a little poem, and I read it to you as we finish today. In Adria's tempest-tossed wastes, my bark through the dark deeps is driven. The canvas all torn from my masts, my timbers by stormy waves are riven. Yet there's faith's assurance ringing clear. Even there will I trust even there. My brook's daily waters had dried. All replenishing springs scorched bare. Resourceless in sore need, I cried to a God who seemed not to care. Though trembling, triumphant I buy. Even now I will trust. Even now. There are one or two other verses, but I'll leave those just for today. Isn't it really interesting? Maybe you listened to this morning's Snapchats snapshots and if you haven't you go back and listen to it because the words here that that Arthur is speaking about that we are not to live by bread alone were exactly the words we were thinking about this morning now, I hadn't read this before I had gone and done the other work but I think God's saying something to us isn't he he's saying no not by bread alone not by what you need materially there's something else and of course what he was saying in Deuteronomy was but by every word of God, God's promises, God's character, God's nature, God himself. You know, you could be supplied with everything materially, and yet you could be the most needy person because you do not have God in your life. You do not have the Lord living in your heart by his spirit. Oh, what a wonderful time this is for people to find the Lord, to find him in a new way, to find him in a real way, to find him in their hardship because that's often one of the best places to find him or it's the place where you most realize that you need him well thank you for joining tonight i hope we'll be able to catch up tomorrow again and as i said if the sound is a little better do let us know we'd love to hear from you for any reason at all if there's anything we can do to help you in church or in the community just let us know and the lord bless you